and welcome into God's presence today. Can you welcome somebody beside you, behind you, and say, welcome to church. Welcome into God's presence. May this day be a glorious day as we worship the living God. Uh, we want to say that today, the two screens behind me are not coming on, so you will have to use the, um, the hymna for the songs, the hymns, and also the creed. You will have to also recite that from your head, and, or you can also use the uh, book of worship, which can be found where you are, or you use the hymna for that also. Let us pray together. Precious Father, we thank you so much for another day of joy, another day of resurrection, another day of restoration, another day of worship. And we thank you for your spirit, your presence that is here. And we thank you for what you are going to do in our midst today. As we worship you, Lord, we offer our hearts unto you as well. And we say, Lord, be enthroned on the breastplate of our hearts today. May this worship truly, O oh God, be unto you. In Jesus' precious name, I have prayed. Amen. Together we say the prayer of invocation. Almighty God, to you all desires are known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as we sing together.
Please be seated. That is our prayer. We want to be like Jesus in our hearts. We want to be more loving. So I want to welcome you all once again into God's presence. And if you are worshiping with us for the first time, whether online or in person, we want you to know that it is our joy to know that you can worship the living God with us today. And we would like to know you and know how we may be of help to you and also be praying for you. And you can reach out to us through our email address or the phone number that can be found right where you are worshiping online. And we will surely get back to you. God bless you as you do so. And the prayer room is open at this time. Uh, please make use of this opportunity in case you want someone to pray with you or pray for someone in your life. Uh, people are right there to pray with you. Please take note of all the information we have for us in the news. I would like to emphasize that next Sunday is a Holy Communion service. Let's be prepared for that. And the noisy bucket collection uh, will also come up next week. And after this service at 11.30 a.m., uh, the youth will also be having their uh, board game uh, today. So let's have it in mind. On Tuesday, our Bible study continue. Uh, please uh, make yourself available either in person or online. And we would like you to please, as we have it in our news, uh, support Wayman uh, AME Church for the uh, cooking that they are doing. And uh, if you have time, please go there to also support them. Thank you. Focus on the children. Hi guys. So how was your week? Did you guys like the snow day? You did? What'd you do? You made a snowman? What'd you do? You played on the snow? Okay. Well, I was just doing schoolwork. So I didn't get to have fun, but yeah. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk to you guys about the Beatitudes. And this is a, like eight lessons that Jesus preached in a sermon on the mountain. So if I were to ask you to tell me what makes you happy, what would your answer be? Would it be something like happiness is scoring the winning goal in a soccer game or happiness is being the most popular person in my class? We all want to be happy, don't we? Does it surprise you that God wants you to be happy? Well, he does. But you might be surprised to find that what, that what Jesus said about happiness is quite different from what you and I might expect. Most of us think that to be happy means to have a lot of money, have plenty to eat, have a lot of toys, having someone to take care of us, or being well liked by everybody. That isn't what Jesus said. One day, Jesus went up to the side of the mountain he sat down, gathered his disciples around him, and began to teach them about happiness. Even though these are not the exact words Jesus said, used, I think they will help us to understand what he thought. He said things like, be happy when you are poor in spirit, because then you will find that your riches are in the kingdom of heaven. Be happy when you feel lost. Be happy when you have lost what is most dear to you, because it is then that you will feel the love of God who is most dear to you. Be happy with what you have because then you will find out that your Heavenly Father provides everything you need. Be happy when you are hungry for the things of God because then you will find that only He can satisfy. Be happy when you are caring for others because it is in caring for others that you will find that you have a Heavenly Father who cares for you. Be happy when your, your heart is right with God, 
Because it is then that you receive that God is at work in the world around you. Be happy when you help others to get along peacefully with one another because it is then that you will know that know the peace that comes from being a part of the family of God. Be happy when others treat you badly because you follow me, because your reward will be great in heaven. So happiness isn't just all about what we get or you know things that material things like toys and food, but happiness is something that you feel in your heart when you help people around you. And when, even though you feel like you've lost everything, you're still happy because you know that Jesus loves you. You see, happiness is not a feeling that is brought about by things that happen to us. It's an attitude that we have because of what we have in our heart. We need to be like the bee, buzzing happily through life because of what God has done for us. So as you go to school this week or whatever you're going to do, even though you might, like I've lost a toy or whatever it is, I just want you to know that God loves you and that it's very important for you to be happy, even though you have lost things that are almost dear to you. Okay, let's pray together. Dear Father, Help us to have the happiness that you want for us. Happiness that comes from what happens to us, but what happens inside of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Old Testament lesson comes from Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Now for the Psalter, it's come from Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 14, and please read responsibly. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has sent a tent for the sun. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The mammon of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The New Testament lesson comes from Matthew, chapter 15, verses 10 through 20. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard the saying? He answered, 
Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. The word of God for the people of God. Please stand as we affirm what we believe about our God in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he seated at the right hand of the Father. And we come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we continue to pray. Precious and everlasting Father, the King of glory the ancient of days, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Lord who has ridden on the clouds of heavens, the one who was, the one who is, the one who continues to be forever, the almighty, mighty God, the Lord that has no equal, we give you praise, we give you thanks, we give you glory, we give you honor, adoration. We worship you, O oh God, as individuals and as a church, as a family. We lift up your name today and we declare that there is none like you. We praise you, you who is the Holy One of Israel. We thank you, Lord Almighty, for you are the breath in our lungs. We thank you, Lord Almighty. Your word says unto us that there is a spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty God has made me. You made us. We are a people of your pasture. Lord, we thank you for who you are in our lives. We thank you for what you've made us to be. We thank you, Lord Almighty, for your great promises for us. And we thank you because, Lord, in every way, you, Almighty God, remain the same. Today, Father, our hearts are drawn to you because of who you are, not just because of what you give to us, but because of your love and because you are God. We praise you, we worship you, we honor you in your house this morning. We thank you, Lord, because everything within us praises you. Lord, we thank you. And Lord, today we 
as living souls come before you and say, Lord, without you, we can do nothing. Even this new day, this new week, without you, Father, without you helping us, we are going nowhere. Whether at home, at work, in our marketplaces, Lord, anywhere. And that is why, Father, we pray today that you will pour out your spirit upon us afresh, that you will enable us, Lord, that the heavenly blessings that are in place for us as your children, you will help us, Lord, to unnest them, to walk in them. Lord, I pray today that in the name that is above all names, you almighty God will quicken our mortal bodies this day because your spirit lives in us. And so, Father, I pray that in the name that is above all names, the name Jesus, you, God, will touch each and every one of us whether online or in person, worshiping you at this time. Lord, touch us at the very point of our needs. Touch the bones. Touch the bloodstreams. Breathe on the flesh. Breathe, O oh Lord, on the joints, the marrows. Lord, I pray that from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet, you almighty God who made us will do that which only you, God, can do in our bodies. Even now, spirit of the living God, breathe on us. Lord, I stand here before your people, and before you, God, as your servant, and I declare that every plan of the wicked one, every plan of the evil one against any of us is hereby averted in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I speak against everything that is not of God, every strategy of the enemy concerning any family here, concerning any individual, that is related to us in one way or the other, Lord, I speak against it today. And I decree that in the name that is above all names, let everything that is not of God be deleted, be canceled in the name of Jesus. For the Bible says that I have been given authority to bind and to lose. And whatsoever I bind here on earth is bound in heaven. And anything I lose here on earth is also loose in heaven. Therefore, I decree that in the name of Jesus, anything that does not glorify God, anything that is from the pit of hell that the enemy has in stock for any of us, for any family, is hereby canceled. Whether it is stored in the sun, in the moon, in the air, under in the land, the scripture says unto us that any tree that God has not planted shall be uprooted. In the name of Jesus, evil trees are uprooted. Evil plans are canceled. Evil networking are disconnected. In the name of Jesus Christ, I speak the peace of God over every soul that is hearing my voice, over every family. I speak the word of God, word of life, over you in the name of Jesus. And I decree that you will walk in the way of God. You will walk in righteousness. You will walk in peace and joy. And you will walk in safety. For the covenant of life rests upon you and your family. And Lord, for adventure, there is someone somewhere right now who is in pain. I pray, Lord Almighty, as your oracle, 
And I pray the Lord, may your word be sent out, O oh Lord, to such people in the north, in the south, in the west, Lord, in the east, at the center of where we are here worshiping. May your word go out to such persons right now. And Lord, let every pain or every suffering, Lord, disappear from them. Lord, I give you praise. For the Bible says you sent forth your word and your word healed your people. Your word delivered your people from their afflictions. I pray, Lord, that your peace will reign supreme in this land, in this country, in the name of Jesus. I give you praise, I give you glory, I give you honor and adoration. I pray, Lord, for that person who think that this word has nothing to offer as many that are ready to give up their life. Lord, as many that are ready to, to end their lives right now, I pray, Lord Almighty, that in the name of Jesus, that spirit of suicide, oh God, we, de we, we, we leave them in the name of Jesus. That spirit of suicide, oh God, we depart from such person. Lord, I pray for divine intervention in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, for the family that is going through pains and questions in their heart because of suicide committed by a member of their family. I just pray, Lord, for such family, wherever they are, that, Lord, your word of comfort will locate them. Thank you, blessed Father, for we can trust you. We can rely on you. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' precious name, I have prayed. And the church say, I want to invite you to talk to God. This is your father's house. It is called a house of prayer. Talk to God. What is that need that you want to present to him today? God wants to hear your voice. Speak to him. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock the door, and the door will be opened to you. May it be unto you according to your request. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Holy manner, hymn of joy.
Thank you so much for that. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Um, let's pray together. Eternal Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you, for it is your delight to speak your mind to us. Thank you, Lord, because the entrance of your word Make us sinful. It brings light unto us. And I pray God Almighty today, as your word comes to us, whether as the preacher or the hearer, may we be transformed. 
May our hearts be purified. And Lord, may we be the people you want us to be. To ourselves, to everyone around us, and towards you, God. Give us understanding. In Jesus' precious name, I pray, and the church say, Amen. Today marks the fourth sermon in the series of the power of words. The power of word. We began by making us to know that the words that we speak are not ordinary. They are always backed up by certain forces, whether positive or negative. The words we speak sometimes can kill people can kill destiny, can also kill we ourselves. The words that we speak can divide, can bring division. Words can also expose that which is meant to be covered, that which is meant to be kept confidential. We also say that words explain and Stick. Word explains and sticks. When you speak certain words, they stay with the people or the person that hears you. For the scripture says unto us that words go down to the inmost part. Words do not just stay on the surface except the person has really determined not to listen to you, except the person has decided, strongly decided, that they are not going to give a down to what someone says against them. But ordinarily, negative words, especially gossip, and words that we speak in a way to bring somebody down or to tell somebody the reality about their lives, to define them who they are not or who they are, and they are trying to work on themselves, to build up their own personal esteem, to get out of the shelf that they have found themselves, and they want to live the life that God wants them to live. When they are doing all that and you speak words that defines them, that tells them the truth about their lives, which is a weakness in them, it stays with them. The Bible says it goes down to the inmost part. And that makes such people to begin to look at themselves in a way that they should not look at themselves. And so we also said to us that James said to us that the tongue is what we should watch. Our tongue, James says to us, even though it is small, it has a big impact on our lives and on people's lives. Tongues, James said to us, has destructive power. It is like a flame and it can set the whole forest, the whole body aflame, on fire. We saw how James also used the imagery of wide anima to describe the tongue. He says that every anima has been tamed by human beings, but the tongue, they have not been able to tame because it is restless and it is also poisonous. But you know, 
even though the tongue is something we have to work on, the tongue also responds to something. The tongue responds to our heart. What the tongue or the mouth says actually comes from the heart. And that is why Jesus invites us to consider what makes the tongue or the mouth utter negative and destructive words. And so today, I'm taking my test from Matthew chapter 15, verses 15 to 19. As we look at the state of our heart and how can we work on this heart and make it to project positive words. Matthew chapter 15, that is where we read this morning, verses 15 to 19. I would like us to read it together. If you are there, uh, you can open it, and whether in your Bible or the bulletin, 15 to 19. Let's go. But Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defies a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, and false witness, slander. That is Jesus' response to what the Pharisees and the scribes, and in fact, Peter's question. So in this test, Jesus addresses the fairly pointless observance of the purity laws. The Pharisees and the scribes were observing the purity laws without any logic, without thinking very deep. They were doing it blindly. There wasn't anything wrong with the laws themselves. They were okay. The laws were, after all, given especially the watching of hands and feet. Were given by God to Moses, and God instructed Moses that this is the Levitical law, this is a priestly law, this is a law that must be observed by the priests and their generations from time to time. Washing of hands and their feet. And you can find that in Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 to 21. So the law itself was okay. But Jesus responded to a fairly pointless observance of the law. Just like he also responded to how they were, I mean, responding and observing the Sabbath law without mercy. So Matthew tells us that some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ said to them, why do you say this? Why do you observe this law without understanding the meaning? And what was the question of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I mean the scribes to Jesus Christ? They asked him, why do your disciples break the tradition, the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Why? We all know that it is, it is normal for people to wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus knew that. But they accused Jesus that his disciples were breaking the Law of the elders. The law of the elders is 
that you just have to observe this blindly. You just have to follow this without thinking, without bringing in any reasoning, regardless of your situation. And so Jesus Christ, in his response, places premium on ethical behavior over ritual observance. Just as, again, he did when it comes to saving lives and observing the law of the Sabbath. So Jesus said, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. What comes out of the mouth, what your tongue says, what comes from your mouth, from your tongue, comes actually from the heart, and this defies a person. What Jesus is talking about here is not vomit. It's not talking about spiritual. It's not talking about you eating and vomiting. No. We know that you can't just put anything into your mouth and say that Jesus said what goes into the mouth is not what defines a man, so I can eat anything. No. Even though he's not talking about vomit, he's talking about the words that we speak. Jesus is saying that words reveal what the person contains deep down. The word we speak reveals who we are. It tells people about our personality. What goes into a person's mouth is merely food which passes through the digestive system and is excreted. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds right from the heart, because that is the seat, the deep level of impurity, and that is what makes me, makes you defined. That is what makes us impure. The heart is the issue. It's not just about your tongue. You need to begin to ask yourself the question, what is in my heart? Because what you say defines you. It tells people the state of your heart. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 6 verse 45 that a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. Listen, it says further, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth responds to what you have in the heart. God did not just cast down the devil, whom we know as the Lucifer. A passage in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 14, tells us why Satan, the Lucifer, was cast down to this world. When you read that passage, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 13, the scripture says, how have you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to the earth. You who are laid low, I mean, you who once laid low the nations. Now listen to this. He said in verse 13, you said in your heart, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Many people ascribe this passage to what God is saying 
as a judgment against the devil. But what one thing it reveals to us is that what we say actually, again, is not until we open this mouth. Right there in the heart, God sees it. You know why God will not commit certain responsibility to some people? It is because he knows the heart of every man. He sees your heart. And that is why the Old Testament that we read today says to us that the heart of a man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can understand it? Because as we are all here, as this man is speaking to you, you are all seated there listening to him. Nobody knows our heart, but he does. And you do. I do. You know your own heart. You know what is there. When you think evil, when you think impure things, your heart is processing them, and God sees everything. Here, he judged this person, he judged Lucifer, because the Lucifer said in his heart. So when you are still processing it, thinking about that impure thought, God sees everything. And that is where we need to begin to walk on our own heart, on our lives. You may be seated and be watching a TV. Somebody may be talking to you. You may be in the company of people, and yet your heart is far away. You are thinking about something immoral with somebody else somewhere. And the person seated beside you may even be your spouse. He or she doesn't know that your mind is gone far away to somebody else somewhere. And what is going on in your heart? It's not something you can open up to that person beside you. The scripture says, you are already speaking in your heart. For you said in your heart. You can speak with your heart. You can also speak from your heart. Making your mouth, your tongue, to project what is in your heart. So don't think that what is in the heart, which is evil, as long as I do not project it out, I am okay. No. The heart has to be dealt with. The scripture says unto us in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, Adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Out of the heart, all these things come. Evil thoughts come from there. Murder comes from there. When you see someone kills people anyhow, just within one week, we've had mass shooting in California, and we know it happens virtually every day now. When somebody picks up the gun and enters into uh, a ballroom, a dance room, and kills 10 people, injured many people, that did not just happen. It has resided, processed in the heart. And when that person also took the gun, and just shot people at random and killed seven people, or when that young boy, a young child of six years old or so, picked up the pistol and shot the mom over toy, just because of toys. I'm not buying toys for you. I'm not buying that for you. Look, it is a matter of the heart. When a man decided that the next thing to do because the wife is divorcing him, 
The next thing to do is to kill the wife and kill five children. I want to tell you it's a matter of the heart. It is evil. It's not just psychological. When we hear things that our country says, the press says, that, oh, this person has a psychological problem, mental problem, it's not just about mental problem. It is everything. Spiritually, it is there. Something is wrong with the human heart. And that is what Jesus is calling our attention to today. That guy, everyone that kills people have processed it. It comes from their heart. He says, and he says murder, adultery, sexual immorality. When somebody does all these things, when somebody bears false witness against someone else, it comes from their heart. Slander comes from the heart. That's what Jesus said. And when you hear the word adultery and sexual immorality that are listed here in this text, they are not just ordinary sexual immorality that we talk about in our context today. The Greek word for near, from which we derive this word, sexual immorality, is also used for prostitution. It is used for immorality, incest, bestiality, pedophilia, adultery, which some people call extramarital intercourse. And I want to tell you, there is nothing like extra, extramarital. There is nothing like, when you want to deceive yourself, you say it's extramarital. It's not, there is, if it is not marital, it is not extramarital because there is nothing else that you can attach to that marital union. Adultery is called adultery. Fornication is called fornication. There is no other name to give to it. It is a deception. Listen to me and every youth that is here, listen. It is a deception when somebody tells you that if you want to have sex, you should pro I mean, protect yourself. It is a deception and it's a message from the pit of hell. If you are not married, listen to me. Pornia that is used in this passage. As it is used for prostitution, for immorality, for incest, for bestialia, for pedophilia, adultery. It is also used for premarital sex. It is used for premarital sex. So don't be deceived that someone tells you or the society tells you that the best way for you to escape pregnancy before marriage or before your graduation is for you to protect yourself. In the first place, you cannot find that in the Bible that you carry about, that you read. Because what is in the scripture is that you must abstain from sexual immorality. It says you must not have it. Don't have it in the first place before marriage. The scripture is not talking about protection. It's talking about abstinence from it. Because every sin, the Bible says, every sin that a man commits is outside of the body. But the sin of adultery, of fornication, is against the body. You commit it against the body. So don't condemn adultery and say that sexual uh, premarital sex is okay. No. Don't condemn bestialia, pedophilia, incest, and say that what you do is okay. No. In fact, the same word that is used here is also used for promiscuity, is used for homosexuality, for lesbianism. It's used for all kinds of sexual activities except the one between man and woman, which is husband and wife. But the Bible says that all these things come from the heart because the heart is the center of human personality. The mouth reveals what is in the heart. 
I say to you today. Your heart reveals what is there. And that is why for me, I believe so much that true religion must diagnose and treat the nature of the heart instead of mere externals. Don't just treat externals. Don't just look at all these lists and think that, oh, we can just overcome it ordinarily. We need to understand that true religion has to deal with all these things. Because they come from the heart. I want to quickly submit to you today steps toward purity of heart. Steps toward purity of heart. How then can I make this heart pure before the Lord? Not before the society, but before the Lord. Because the society does not believe that if you have evil thoughts, and it resides, and it also projects itself into actions that it is wrong. The society today, the system, does not tell you or condemn you that when you have premarital sex, it is wrong. You are a Christian. You are born again. If you are born again, you are a child of the living God. You are different. So how can I have a purified heart? How can the condition of my heart be okay toward God and the people around me? Number one, you must have a spiritual heart transplant. That is the best way I can tell you about this. And what it means simply is you must be born again. Be born again. Have a spiritual heart transplant. Something must be done just as a physical person physically have or go through heart surgery. You must have a spiritual heart transplant. In Jeremiah chapter 24 verse 7, God said, I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. They will be my people. And I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their heart. Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26. God also said, I will give you, it's a promise, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of of flesh. That is God promising spiritual heart transplant. That you, when you turn to God, is going to change your heart. If you are ready for it, God is going to do, he's going to do circumcision, spiritual circumcision of your heart so that evil thoughts will not continue to reside and stay in your heart to the extent that they will make you to speak words that you should not speak. Number two, if you want a purified heart, pray for God's assistance. Ask God to assist you, for you cannot do it alone. Psalm 141, verses 3 and 4 says to us, Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart be drawn to what is evil so that I take part in wicked deeds along with those who are evildoers. Do not let me eat their delicacies. You can see here in these two verses a relationship, clear relationship between the mouth and the heart that guard my mouth, put a door, on the leaves of my mouth. Do not let my heart be drawn to the evil ones. The two of them go together. And I tell you, if you struggle with evil thoughts in your heart, you can cry out to God for help. You can tell the Lord to help you. 
if you know anyone around you who struggles with evil thoughts and they, they have what people call mental problem and everyone keeps saying it is just about their heart. I do not rule out mental problem. And I want you to understand that. It is real. Mental health is real. But I want to tell you that if anyone has heart problem, they struggle to keep themselves up. Pray for such people. And it could be you. Pray for yourself. And the last thing I want to say is that you need to store up God's word in your heart. Store God's word up in your heart. Eat the word of God. Eat it. If I ask you today, how often do you read the Bible? After living here, do you have time to study the word of God? Do you? It is what, in, what is in your heart. What you fill this heart with that we project from there. If you do not have the word of God here, you may just live this life as ordinary Christian, church Christian, denominational Christian, who does not have anything, anything godly residing here through the word of God. You need to fill your heart every day with the word of God. Jeremiah 15 verse 16 says, your words were found. And I want you to please listen to this. It says, your word were found, and I ate them. I hate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. This prophet found the word of God, and he said, I ate it. He took in the word of God. He read the word of God. He meditated upon it. He digested the word of God. He has time for the word of God. And in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 20, I'm not going to read everything. I'm just going to read two verses for you here. Put on them. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate heart, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let the word of God be here all the time. Don't go through this word, this life, through your week without the word of God. Have time for it. Study it. Slow down. Store it here. If you don't have it, you don't have it. And if you have it, you have it. It becomes part of you. It transforms you. It changes you. Changes situations around you. As I close, the scripture says that a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. What do you have in your heart? Is your heart empty? I want to tell you there is nobody whose their heart is empty. It is either pure or impure. It is either God's word or the word of this world. Your heart can never be empty. It is either your heart is occupied by the spirit of God or it is occupied by the spirit of this world. It is either your whole heart is occupied, filled with the law of God or with the law of this world. Ask God to help you. Every evil thing you see around begins from thought, little thought. And it's built up. And it forms. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, please cleanse this heart. Change us to be more like you. 
Transform these hearts, Lord God. Come into our hearts, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We we'll rise as we sing the doxology. I want to pray for us as we go into this word. I want you to please make this confession after me. Repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your spirit in me. I thank you for bringing me into this day and this new week. I am yours and yours alone. As I go into this week, I offer my body to you. I offer my heart to you. I offer my spirit and my soul to you. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your power. Help me, Lord, to walk in your way. Circumcise my heart. Purify it with the fire of the Holy Spirit and the power of your word. May my heart never be drawn to the wicked and to the tools of the wicked. May I live for you as a purified person with a purified heart. I thank you for everything I lay my hands upon this week will prosper. Thank you because you will guide me in the ways I go and you will bring me back with rejoicing. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and mind in love and knowledge of God Almighty and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.